Now, for the, um, the, uh, the, the final act of the evening, uh, we welcome Vint back to the stage. Uh, and I think we have some microphones in the audience, and we're just going to go straight into Q&A. I mean, Vint, I, really what I wanted to ask you, first of all, was we, picking up on the, the last conversation that we had at the, at the beginning. When you and the, and the other guys were working on that back in the, in the 60s and 70s, did, did you have the notion in your head that the internet was going to change the world? What were you trying to achieve in those days? In other words, what were we thinking? What were you thinking? So, uh, the, well, of course, the, the trivial answer would be no, we had no clue. But that wouldn't be true. Uh, of course, we couldn't imagine everything that's happened. Uh, certainly uh, not all of the various applications that have uh, arisen out of this basic platform. On the other hand, I think all of us had a pretty strong sense of how powerful this technology was. And, if I could um, separate the uh, ARPANET and the work that was done at JP or NPL and uh, UCL uh, from the internet period, uh, the difference is that by the time Bob Kahn and I started thinking about how to build a multi-network system, we already had had four years of experience with the ARPANET plus the uh, exposure to the Ethernet project at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, plus the experiences that had already been um, had here uh, at uh, UCL and at NPL and at Cyclade in, in France. So there were, oh, and on top of all that, some of you will remember a man named Douglas Engelbart, uh, who was at SRI International and in the late 60s uh, and early 70s developed what was called the online system. If you go on the net and you look for the mother of all demos, you will see a 1968 presentation of his online system. He was interested in augmenting human intellect by adding the computer uh, to uh, brain power and making us work together. So he invented the mouse, he invented the portrait mode display, he invented hyperlinking because the online system allowed you to create documents which linked to each other with the click of a mouse. This is all in the mid to late 1960s. We had that system on board the ARPANET and was available to us. So uh, email was invented in 1971. Uh, file transfer and remote access to timeshare systems were part of the uh, ARPANET program. Uh, so that, that collective experience very much informed the possibilities of this technology. On the other hand, it's a little hard to predict what happens when two and a half to three billion people suddenly get online and start sharing information. So although Engelbart should get lots of credit for his very early work, he invented sort of a one host World Wide Web. And when Tim Berners-Lee and subsequently Mark Andreessen did the browsers and the servers of the web, what they did was to enable literally millions of people to generate and contribute content and to share and discover each other through this uh, internet-based platform. And that was simply dramatic. So I think we sensed how powerful this was. I wouldn't have spent what is now over 40 years of my career and lifetime pushing this stuff if I didn't believe in it even back then. Uh, but mostly we were just trying to get it to work. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I have to, I'm sure you're familiar with this phenomenon. If you know a lot about how something works, it's a miracle when it does. And so every time a web page shows up, I'm always astonished. Because <laughs> I think, I know what happened in order to get from you know, wherever it was into my machine. All this stuff has to actually work. And, and so now who's got a question for, for Vint? Uh, and if you can say who you are when you stand up and ask a question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wendy Grossman. Um, I'm curious, if, well, it's kind of a future question rather than a past question, but I wouldn't like people to think you did your last good work in 1982. Um, how is the Deep Space Internet project going? It's going extremely well. Um, this is a project that began in 1998 at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. My colleagues and I in that year uh, saw the Pathfinder project land successfully on Mars. The previous successful landing had been in 1976 with the Viking. And so as we sat down contemplating the plans for uh, future exploration of Mars, we asked ourselves, what should we be doing now, that is to say in 1998, in anticipation of what might be needed 25 years later? 
And we concluded that instead of just using point-to-point -point radio links to connect spacecraft to each other or to back to Earth, that we should endeavor to create a rich networking environment for space exploration to support both manned and robotic uh, uh, initiatives. We also wanted to make sure that we could deal with complex environments like multiple orbiters, uh, multiple moving objects, rovers and things on the surface, uh, distributed sensor networks, spacecraft flying in tandem, you know, this huge range of potential configurations that would not be well supported by just point-to-point -point radio links. And we started out thinking, well, maybe we can use TCP IP because it worked okay on Earth, so it probably would work on Mars. And it probably will work on Mars. The trouble is that it doesn't work very well between the planets. And the simple answer to that, uh, for that, and the reason for that, is that the speed of light is too slow. Uh, when we're closest together in our respective orbits, we're 35 million miles apart. And at the speed of light, that's three and a half minutes of transit delay, to say nothing of the other three and a half to come back. So it's seven minutes round trip time when we're closest together. When we're farthest apart, it's 20 minutes one way, 40 minutes round trip time. The TCP flow control system is very simple. When it runs out of room, it says stop. And if it's only a few hundred milliseconds before the other guy hears you, you can buffer a little bit, and then the flow stops. But on Mars, if it's 40 minutes before you, you know, anything comes back, you say stop and this guy keeps transmitting for 20 minutes until he hears that you uh, said please stop and all the packets are flying and they're landing on the ground and you know, disappearing. So uh, the variable delay of the uh, space environment was problem number one. The second problem that made TCP not so attractive is uh, planetary motion. You know, planets are rotating and, and we couldn't figure out how to stop that. <laughs> so, so, so if you're talking to a thing on the surface, it rotates until you can't talk to it again until it comes back around, and satellites have the same problem. So we had to develop a suite of protocols called delay and disruption tolerant networking, which we have now done. Starting in 98, we went through four iterations of the design. The prototype software is actually operating now on the rovers on Mars, the Mars Science Lander, Curiosity, and uh, Opportunity. Uh, and the previous, uh, the other one, um, the two rovers were using them. There's, a, a, if you don't mind, a, an odd little circumstance. Originally, the plan for the rovers in 2004 was to transmit data from the surface of Mars back to Earth using the deep space network. And it was designed to run at 28.5 kilobits per second. And the scientists were not happy about that, but we told them it was the best we could do over interplanetary distances. Uh, when they turned the radio on, it overheated. And so now we said, well, we better back off the duty cycle because we don't want to damage the radios. And that made the scientists even more unhappy. But one of the JPL engineers said, well, there's an X-band radio on board the uh, orbiters, which have been put in place to map the surface of Mars to decide where the rovers should go. And there's an X-band radio on the rovers. So why don't we reprogram the rovers and the orbiters so that they could form a store and forward network by squirting the data from the rover up to the satellite as it comes around and then hanging on to the data until it gets to the right place in its orbit to transmit data back to the deep space network. So this is a little three node store and forward network and it worked. So 99.9% .9 of all the data that's come back from Mars has gone store and forward through the orbiting relays. When the Phoenix lander arrived on May of 2008 at the North Pole, there was no configuration that would allow a direct to Earth path, so they had to use store and forward. Then the epoxy spacecraft, which used to be called Deep Impact, had rendezvoused with a comet and launched a probe into it some years ago. And when it came back around again to rendezvous with Hartley 2, uh, we reprogrammed it with the Deep Space uh, DTN protocols, and we tested the protocols in deep space. Uh, it was like 81 light seconds away during those uh, tests, and that worked. So now we have the International Space Station, the rovers on Mars, the orbiters, and Earth as part of the interplanetary backbone. We're standardizing the protocols with the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems this year. We hope to finish this year. And once that's standardized, any of the spacefaring nations can use those protocols either for their scientific missions or when the mission's complete, the spacecraft can be repurposed as nodes of an interplanetary backbone. So I'm expecting over the course of the next decades that we will literally grow an interplanetary backbone as each space mission can be converted into a store and forward relay. 
Now, if you don't mind one other little <laughs> codicil, there's one more experiment underway. And uh, it is a group here in the UK, the ICARIS Interstellar Group, is involved in this project along with a couple of others who have uh, won a contract, a grant, from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency to design a spacecraft to get to the nearest star in 100 elapsed years. Now, in order to do this, you have to overcome three problems. Problem number one is propulsion. The current propulsion systems would get us to Alpha Centauri in 65,000 years. <laughs> this is a little long for an ARPA project. So, uh, you know, considering that six times longer than our civilization has even existed. So uh, the first problem is to get a uh, propulsion source that will get us up to 20% the speed of light. And the reason we have to get up to that speed is that at the 50-year mark, we have to turn around and slow down, because otherwise we'll just go through that system and get one photograph and that's it. So <laughs> very expensive project. So the idea is to literally uh, get up to 20% the speed of light midway and then turn around, slow down, get into orbit. The second problem is navigation. When you think about how we navigate in the interplanetary world, typically we'll launch a spacecraft and halfway through the mission we will do mid-course correction. You send a radio command to it telling it what to do and then not too long after that you get back what happened. Now we could be talking minutes to hours to get the uh, response back, but now imagine that you have this interstellar spacecraft and it's a light year away. It's going to take a year to tell it, please you know, do your mid-course correction. It'll be another year before you find out what happened. It's not exactly an interactive conversation. Fortunately, we know enough about the um, uh, proper motion of the stars that were within 10 light years of uh, the solar system to be able to navigate to them based on stars that are farther away whose position doesn't change very much when you move as many as uh, four light years away. So that will probably be the solution to that problem. Then there's this problem of signaling. How do you generate a signal that you could actually detect from four light years away? And so one thought was to use a femtosecond laser. You imagine you have a 100 watt source and you compress the signal down to 10 to the minus 15 seconds, which is a very, very big pulse. And you should be able to detect that, except for one problem. When you're four light years away, even if it's a collimated laser, it's going to beam spread about the size of the solar system. So you now, I need, now you know why I need the interplanetary backbone, to build a synthetic aperture receiver that's the size of the solar system to reassemble the light coming back from the signal from <coughs> Alpha Centauri. But one of the physicists in the group suggested a better solution, or at least a more intriguing one. You all know that gravity bends light. That's how we were able to demonstrate that Einstein's theory was correct. During an eclipse of the sun, we could see the starlight literally moving. Uh, because of the uh, gravitational field of the sun. So imagine that you get a spacecraft that's 550 astronomical units away from the Earth. That's a, approximately the point where the sun's gravity lends, where the sun, sun's gravity will bend light into a focal point. So if we could put a spacecraft out there, that's about 65 billion miles away or so, um, then we could actually generate the signal at Alpha Centauri and literally recollimate or re refocus the light to a spacecraft that's at the proper focal length uh, for a, a solar um, uh, reset receiver. And then that, that focal uh, plane will actually extend all the way from 550 to as many as 1,000 AU out. So that's the current state of the art. <laughs> we are operational with this, with this system. And uh, the next steps are to continue to populate uh, spacecraft as we go farther, farther out. Uh, into the rest of the solar system. So that's well, the up-to-the-date story. Where we well, are. What's the time scale there on, on success on that project? Say again? Well, what's the time scale on that project? That you well, it started in 1998, so it's but taken... for the next phase, the oh, Well, for the, the, rest, the rest of the time will, is purely a function of when each of the new missions will be launched. So the next big spate of Mars-based missions come in the 2020 period. There, I think there may be 2018 for at least one such uh, system. So during the second, uh, third decade of the 21st century, we'll see some additional spacecraft going out. And then after that, it's just a question of what uh, the world is willing to spend in the way of space exploration to slowly accrete this. The good part is you don't have to build the whole thing at once. You just build it uh, step by step as missions uh, dictate, which is how the internet grew. It's very organic. We just said, look, if you can build a system that behaves this way, and you can find somebody that's willing to connect to you, 
then you can grow the internet, and that's exactly what's happened. Okay, ne next question. question. Yes, ma'am. My name is Hadley Beeman. I want to start by telling you that at the last W3C technical plenary, we hosted a session on building the interplanetary web, uh, piggybacking on all of wow. your work and your protocols. So thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome, but I do need to tell you that if you're accustomed to rapid response time from the <laughs> wide web, this is not likely your friend. Uh, we couldn't even use the domain name system. Imagine that you're on Mars and you're trying to do a lookup of something on Earth. Okay, so. 40 minutes later, if you're lucky, you get back the IP address of the domain name you were looking for, except by that time it's wrong because it was moving and it got a new IP address. Mm. So we had to build a delayed binding architecture that was quite different, but anyway. That's... We also found geocoding and relative time to be a challenge, <laughs> but never mind. Um, I'm currently working for the uh, UK government's cabinet office, and we're having an ongoing discussion about the value of IPv4 addresses. Um, what do you think? Are they still valuable or are they on their way out? Well, first of all, you really need IPv4 now because that's what almost everybody is using, but we must get to IPv6. It's, it was officially turned on last year on June 6th, but the original uh, standardization took place as far back as 96 to 98, but the uptake had been very, very slow, and it, it's been a mystery to me. The software at the edges of the net um, on laptops, desktops, and things like that are almost all capable of using IPv6. The router vendors have made IPv6 work in parallel with IPv4 uh, for the most part. You might need to add some memory because the tables are big from if you have both v4 and v6 routing tables at the same time. The thing is that the ISPs have refused to or have dragged their feet about turning on IPv6. And the assertions are something like, well, nobody's asking for it. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, give me a break. No human being except a geek would even know that you need to have v4 and v6. You know, what, you've never asked for it. The job of the ISPs and the rest of us is to suppress the need to know that and simply put it in and make it work. So if those of you who are here in town and have internet service from anybody, whether it's you know, BT or somebody else, will you please ask them, what is your IPv6 plan? And have a tantrum if they aren't able to tell you that so that they get the message, which is you need to have the additional address space. Otherwise, the Internet of Things won't happen very well. Carrier grade network address translation is an abomination because it's, it's very uh, brittle, for one thing, and it interferes with some end-to-end -end, uh, security that I'd like to see common throughout the net. So we really need IPv6. It's time to get, you know, get over this. Look, you're using the 1978 experimental internet right now. <laughs> you know, let's get into the 21st century. Sorry, rant. Okay. Next question. Yes. Talking of which, if you had a time machine, yes, and you could go back to those 1970s and make maybe one change to TCP and one change to IP. Would you put in security, more security, content control? Would you put charging, end-to-end -end charging, or would you just well, expand the address space? One change to TCP and one change to IP. Oh, well, that's not fair, because <laughs> actually I would make several changes. But first of all, um, I would put in more security mechanisms, but I must say that at the time that was not feasible partly because not all the technology that one would have wanted was available. Uh, here's an irony for you. We start the first design of the TCP protocols in 1973. We actually, Bob Kahn and I briefed the design at the University of Sussex at the International Network Working Group meeting in September of 73 here in the UK. It was the first presentation was not made in the US, it was made here. Um, by 1977, we're very close to the standard that you're using today. And my two friends at Stanford, Whitfield Diffie and Marty Hellman, published their 1977 paper on public key cryptography. The paper is a speculation about the existence of mathematical functions which would permit this kind of uh, asymmetric cryptography to work. Now, unknown to us, the guys at GCHQ had actually invented this idea in 1974, but they were forced to keep it secret. So the first public emergence of this was 1977. That's a year before we standardized the internet protocols that you're using today. There wasn't an RSA implementation until a couple of years later, I think 1979. 
So uh, we, we just missed the timing on that. I felt like I had to just get on with implementation because I was at ARPA running the program and it was time to you know, get this thing out of experimental stage and into real operation. So that's, I would have added security if I could. Now it turns out, ironically, I did do work on a secured version of the system. Guess who I worked with? The National Security Agency, <laughs> starting in 1975. And so we did do a design and we implemented packet-based cryptography. The problem is that the available technology at the time was classified. It was, you know, crypto-grade, military-grade crypto. Uh, the packet encryptors that we experimented with eventually turned into blacker. But I couldn't tell my colleagues who didn't have any clearances what that design looked like and what the mechanisms were. Some of it we managed to make visible. Uh, our RFC 1108 for the geeks in the crowd talks about end-to-end uh, -end IP version, IPsec, and encryption of, uh, of the contents of the packets. So that's one area that I would have done more of if, if the technology had been available at the time. Uh, in the case of the IP uh, system, I would have had 128-bit address space instead of 32, so we wouldn't have to go through this. Truth to tell, in 1977, we actually had a debate about how big the address space should be. And when Bob and I were doing the original work, we asked ourselves this question, and we said, well, let's see, how many networks will there be per country? And we thought, well, maybe there would be two, because you know, there were big, expensive networks. We'd just done the ARPANET, and it cost a certain amount of money. So we thought there would be two networks per country that would give some competition. And then uh, the question was, how many countries? were there, and we didn't know, and there wasn't any Google to ask, so we guessed. <laughs> and we guessed at 128, because that was a power of two, you know, all programmers think that way. So that was 256 network, which is eight bits, and then we said, how many hosts will there be in each net? And that was, in those years, it was, there were big time-sharing machines, so we guessed 16 million machines, which would be 24 bits, that's 32 bits. In 77, we had a big argument uh, in, the, in the research community, should it be 32 bits, 128 bits, or variable length? The variable length guys lost instantly because the programmer said if you have a variable length packet, you'll waste all your cycles searching for the fields of the packet, and that would be silly and expensive and slow, so we didn't do that. And 128 bits, which gives you 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses, didn't pass the red face test. I mean, why would you need you know, 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses to do an experiment? On top of which, a lot of the packets were little interactive things carrying one byte of data, can you imagine one little byte of payload and, and you know, 80 or, or 100 bytes worth of overhead? That didn't look too attractive, especially when we were running on a 50 kilobit backbone. So we ended up with 32. I would change that. Uh, the, and I, as to charging, I think we got it right. I would never charge on an end-to-end -end basis at all. I, I love the model that says everybody pays to get access to the net, and then they do whatever the heck they want after that. That's a powerful model. It's one which is allowed literally hundreds of thousands of different operators of each of the various networks of the internet to make independent decisions about the equipment, the software, and everything else they use. The charging structure is simply to cover the cost of the access network. The networks that are interconnected through the, the uh, backbone uh, are working independently uh, of any of that to determine how they're going to interconnect on one circumstances and whether or not anybody pays anybody else. So, I frankly think that, that we were just lucky to uh, come upon that tactic in order to recover the cost of the net and not do the kinds of sender pays or any other kind of thing that was common in the telephone system. So that's, I'm sorry that wasn't a short answer, but. Gentleman in red at the back. Hi, Richard Milward. Um, I suspect if we took a time machine 40 years into the future, um, the kind of discussion we've had in this part of the um, uh, meeting would be far, far predominant. I mean, in all my lifetime, and I've been working with computers since the late 70s, computers have been a commodity. And, and it seems to me that there isn't so much interesting about the computers these days, but there's a huge interest in the standards, interoperability, and the thinking about information yes. structures that, yes. that you've been discussing just now. I'd be interested in your comments on that. So um, uh, let, me, let me suggest two exercises, maybe th three exercises we can take. The first one is, what happens if we were to all transport ourselves back to 1963, 50 years ago, what would happen to us? And I have at least three ideas 
The first thing is that we'd all break our noses in the first week walking into doors that didn't open for us. <laughs> and of course, our friends of that time would say, why did you do that? And you'd say, well, where I come from, the doors open automatically. And they'd say, well, you have to turn this knob. <laughs> and then you're in the lab, and you're sitting with your hands under the faucet. And they're saying, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm waiting for the water to come out. And he said, well, there's this handle. You, know, you have to turn that. He said, oh, well, where I come from, the faucets turn on automatically. And we won't even go into the part about they ask you why you didn't flush the toilet. <laughs> so, so there are you know, a bunch of things would happen to us, things that we would expect. Now, the second exercise is to ask, what would happen to someone from 2063 who came back to 2013? What would they expect that you know, we wouldn't uh, have available? And, and some of it you can almost guess at because we're there. I mean, it's things like speech understanding, speech recognition, uh, the ability to have a conversation with a computer, discuss what it is you're trying to accomplish as opposed to just typing in keywords. We're getting better and better at speech recognition, for example, although it's still amusing to, uh, to watch the, uh, even uh, the Google's very good speech recognition still does some fairly funny things. Uh, I remember one time we were trying to do an automatic captioning and the, the sentence was, and all uh, customers will get a free sample. And it came back, all customers will get a free salmon. They're mm. obviously a fishy offer, but uh, I know, minus two, <laughs> bad. So, uh, so I'm pretty sure of that. There's a guy named Alan, uh, sorry, it's, uh, oh gosh, Weiser, Mark Weiser. And uh, he was at Xerox Park uh, and passed away early, but uh, it's a pity. But, uh, he envisioned what he called ubiquitous computing, and the idea was that the computers would literally melt away into the landscape. You wouldn't notice them and wouldn't think of them as computers. We're getting closer and closer to that, especially as this Internet of Things begins to arise where all the appliances are programmable. Some of them may have voice capability. Uh, certainly, uh, they can both uh, deliver information to you and possibly accept various uh, kinds of uh, commands or requests. And you can imagine when you get standardization and you have, let's take um, entertainment equipment. Suppose that all of your, you know, if you're like me, you have a bunch of boxes at home that, that manage your entertainment. Uh, that tell, and they all have these little remote infrared controllers. And you know, I fumble around with them until I figure out which one it is I'm supposed to use for that box. And that's usually the one with the dead battery. So <laughs> what I want is to put them all on the local net at home and then use my mobile as my control system, or even my local laptop or a pad, so that I can go to a third party and say, please uh, put these movies and this music up in my entertainment system, and then, then it will take care of loading all the things into the entertainment system. So you can easily imagine the, the, the stuff that is obviously possible today. It's the thing that gets farther out, like the self-driving cars, which Google has now and maybe conceivably um, uh, you know, commercially uh, possible in a decade or less. Um, then you get into smart cities. Imagine that you, you design a city around the idea that almost everything, the buildings and the devices in it, the things that we carry around in our person, things in the car, things at the office, things at home, are all part of this ubiquitous network. Now, anyone who cares about security and strong authentication and everything else you know, gets very nervous about pictures like that, as they should. There's no reason why we cannot design and build a system that is far more secure than the one we have now. And so I imagine, as we uh, go into the future, we will be forced to do a better and better job of creating highly reliable, uh, much more secure, uh, and much more strongly authenticated architectures in order to allow all of the advantage of computer control systems to emerge. Thank you. Now, I think we are, I'm afraid we are out of time. We're going to have to end it there. And I, I should just say, you, you finished spending the next six months in, in Europe, I think. And I should just warn you that there are, in Europe, there are still very, very few auto, automatically flushing toilets. So just, just be aware of that, <laughs> that point. Um, good. Well, look, um, thank you very much indeed for, for that. And thank you to all our speakers uh, tonight. I hope you enjoyed uh, the evening as much as, as we did. It was terrific to have you. Uh, do stay. I think there's a, there's a little bit more uh, drink to be consumed. Uh, there's a little bit more candy floss. And um, I hope you'll join us at our next event. So thank you for, uh, very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>